Well, hopefully I can read the scripture rather than I could the music notes. Well, good morning. Today is July 30th, 2023, West Valley Grace Fellowship. Pastor David Haggard. The message this morning will encourage you in your walk with the Lord. This open the prayer. Father, I thank you that your word gives us all that we need to live our Christian life in this present evil age. Help, help us to know your word and to apply it to our life so that we can have contentment and peace in these troubled times. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, the message this morning is titled Expectations. Um, what do you expect out of life? What do you expect the world to be like? Are you constantly frustrated and agitated by what you see going on around you, going on around the world, what you see or read in the news? And if so, why? Why is that? What do you expect people to be like? Are your beliefs or expectations realistic? Do you find that life or people live up to your expectations? If not, what's the problem? Well, it's either going to be in people or it's going to be in your expectations, right? So where is the problem? Maybe we're like Karen Carpenter. Remember her back in the, what was it, the 70s? Sometimes I have her problem. She's saying, um, I know I ask perfection of a quite imperfect world, and fool enough to think that's what I'll find. Remember that song? I know I need to be in love. Well, there's some truth to that. Someone, someone else has said, well, the, the key to happiness is lowering your expectations. <laughs> there's some truth to that. So it all boils down to our worldview. Is our worldview consistent with what we see around us? For instance, do you believe that people are basically good? If you believe that, and you look around you, you're going to have some cognitive dissonance, right? If you look at the news, you would probably think that that's not true. So does our worldview, does, does what we see every day support what we think, how the world should be, I guess? So when our reality doesn't match our worldview, what do we do? You know, the law of non-contradiction says that two opposite things cannot both be right. So what is your worldview? What do you expect out of life? Are your expectations being met? If they're not, as Phil would say, Dr. Phil would say, how does that make you feel? <laughs> or as the late Zig Ziglar used to say, most of your problems come from stinking thinking. Anybody remember reading Zig Ziglar back in the day? So we're going to go over a few uh, conflicting views, the usual suspects. What about sickness? Why do we think about that? How do we deal with that? What do we expect? Well, if you go over to Acts chapter 5, verse 16, we're going to read about how it used to be. So when we have here the, uh, the start of the kingdom church, it says, in a multitude... Acts 5, 16, gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And uh, a few of them were healed. Is that what your Bible says? No. How many were healed? Everyone. All of them. So we see that uh, this was, a, you know, they were all healed. It was an evangelistic tool. If you go over to James chapter 5 and 15, talks about, uh, was well, any of you sick? Let the elders pray for him and he'll be healed. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and will, they will raise him up. And I notice in James 5.15, those are what? Indicative, uh, not subjective verbs. It will happen, not it may happen or it might happen. So under the kingdom, the Bible says it will happen, not that it might happen. So if we take that today, though, we're like, well, oh, that's a problem here. What happens today, though? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll jump over there. 
If we're expecting something to happen and it doesn't, we're going to be disappointed. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we need to look at two, probably think about what is often said about these things. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 7, Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure, or lest I get a big head, lest I get proud, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now we just read, read that what was it was a this thing, these, these things will happen in the kingdom. Paul says, Well, concerning this thing, concerning this thorn in the flesh, concerning this affliction he had, I pled with the Lord, I begged the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And God said, Okay, if you'll quit bugging me, I'll take it out of you. No, he said. No, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul went on to pout about this the rest of his life. He was bitter against God. He, he never got over the fact that God wouldn't take this thorn out of his flesh. No, really, Paul said, what did Paul, what was Paul's reaction? God said, no, I'm not going to take it away. My grace is enough for you. Paul said, well, therefore, there's this conclusion most gladly, not reluctantly, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. Why? So that, there's a purpose clause, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For or because when I am weak, then I am strong. There's how we deal with it. It's not man's way. Philippians 2.27. Flip over a few books. Now here we have a proof that Paul had Epaphroditus in verse 25. It says he was Epaphroditus was interesting. Epaphroditus was sick. But what was Epaphroditus worried about? He's not worried about the fact that he's sick. He's worried that they're worried about him being sick. Right? He says, For indeed, verse 27, he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So we see here by Paul's later ministry, he, he wasn't able to heal. That was just the way things went. We're still in this age where healing, God may heal, but he may not heal. If healing was really happening today, don't you think that people would be lined up? You know, not the fake, you know, we, we've all seen the fake stuff on TV, you know. And, uh, you, you've heard that joke about the guy who went to the faith healer, you know, and he went up to the neck. After it was dying, they came up to the front, you know, and the guy says, what's your, what's, what's, what do you need prayer about? And the guy says, well, preacher, I need, I want you to pray about my hearing. And the preacher grabbed him both sides of his ears and shouted and prayed and then and threw him back on the ground. And, and then the guy got back up and the preacher says, now, how's your hearing? He goes, no, I meant my court hearing I got coming up on Monday. <laughs> You know, the masses, the masses just of people came to Christ. They were lined up to get healed. The same thing with Peter. Anyway, that's not happening. So we expect that's going to happen. You know, God in his grace may heal. He may not. What about prayer? What do we expect to happen when we pray about things? Well, then, uh, let's go over to Matthew 21. We've got to make sure we don't have wrong expectations because it'll set us up for disappointment. Matthew 21. Well, let me uh, back up verse 21. So Jesus answered and said unto them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, 
you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. That's pretty, you know, that word, certain. In the King James, it, it puts it even perhaps stronger. In the King James, it says, all things whatsoever you shall receive. So again, this is the indicative mood. It's not the subjective mood, subjunctive mood. It's, it's it, if this, then that. So, you know, they'll say, well, uh, you know, if, you, if your prayer, if you didn't get healed and if your prayers weren't answered, uh, it's your fault. You know, you just didn't have enough faith. But what, what did Christ say? He said, well, if you have faith, even as a mustard seed, so it wasn't, it wasn't how much faith you had. Those in the power of God, in the Gospels, you know, if you want to say, well, no, it just, you just need a little bit of mustard seed. And they'll talk about, well, you know, you need to have more faith. And they, you just go over to, I don't think this is in your notes, Hebrews um, 11. You know, sometimes people quit reading too quickly. Hebrews 11, as you know, is the chapter of faith with all these examples given of men and women in Scripture who achieved great things for God because of their faith. And they say, see, if you've got faith, these are the great things that's going to happen to you. But go to, um, uh, let's jump down to verse 30. Well, the second half of verse 35 in Hebrews, after listing all these great Hebrews of faith, then it says, others, meaning others with the same faith, were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. So this idea that, well, you know, the health and wealth preacher, well, you know, if you just have enough faith, God's going to bless you. I mean, just send me your money and God will tenfold it and you'll, you'll get back tenfold what you send to me. And uh, don't get me started, I guess. So, <laughs> um, I just keep thinking about Pastor Olstein and his million dollar homes and stuff. But. So, what about now? Well, when it comes to prayer, as they say, you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathrobe. There's two extremes you got to avoid. Um, on the one hand, we aren't to expect miraculous answers to prayer as we read Matthew, but on the other hand, we don't want to go to the other extreme of some today who say, well, you know, you shouldn't pray about anything except spiritual things. That's just equally an error. Uh, there is a correlation between prayer and events. In 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4, he says uh, that we are to pray for those who are in authority so that, purpose clause, that we can have quiet and peaceful lives. And I don't know about you, but it's, it's counterintuitive maybe. When, um, when I like who's in office, it's easier to pray for them than when I don't really care for who's in office. And I don't think Paul means to pray in precatory prayers like David did in the Psalms about our leaders, but we are to pray for them so that they can make proper decisions and we can lead quiet and peaceful lives. And in some respects, it's kind of like, um, I remember years ago, you know, when, um, when I used to do backpacking in high school, you know, and so, uh, you know, we were poor, so our backpack came from Kmart. It was like the bottom shelf stuff, right? And then some other kids on the trip, they would have those real high-end backpacks or hiking boots, right? They had those really expensive, fancy hiking boots, and we had uh, boots from the Army Surplus store. What was interesting was the the people who had the expensive backpacks, when you get done, they take it off, they, they set it down ever so gently on the ground. 
And us guys with the El Cheapo backpacks, we just undo the straps and just let it fall to the ground, you know. But what was actually the ones that were better built, the expensive ones could have taken being dropped to the ground better than my cheap Kmart one, right? Um, so the point I was going to make was we, we would take better care of the stuff that could take the abuse as opposed to treating gently the stuff that couldn't take the abuse. So what I'm trying to, a long way around, get to the application is, when it comes to praying for leaders, the ones that we don't want to pray for are probably the ones who need prayer the most. Whereas the ones who are already on a godly path, they need them, but probably not as much as the ones who we don't want to pray for. Maybe that went off the rail, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> In Philippians 1.19, Paul prayed for physical deliverance. Uh, go over to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to come here again probably later. But Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says, that, What are you to pray about? Well, if it's any, anything that bugs you, pray about it. If it's saying if it's, uh, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. Uh, Romans 8.26, uh, we're going to come back to Philippians, so we'll skip that for now. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Isn't that the truth? You ever sat down or knelt down or whatever your position is of praying? You just kind of pray like this. <laughs> you don't even know where to start. You don't know what God's will is. You don't even know what you think about it. But you know something needs to be done about it. But don't you like the second half of this verse? We don't know how we should pray as we all, but... The Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He intercedes for us. He knows our heart. He knows the heart of the Father. And, and sometimes you just feel Him kind of just saying, okay, I'll take it from here. I'll take over. And He, he does that. But He says, let me continue. Now, He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that how many things work together for good to those who love God? All, right? So we are to pray about all things, and if you go to if you, if you continue on, when he talks about what can separate us from love of Christ in verse 35, shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Verse 37, yea, in all these things we barely get by. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors. Now, more than conquerors to me, I've used this analogy where it's not, it's not like the Rocky movie, right? Where you kind of win, but you can barely stand up and you're then you collapse and they have to, you know, who won the fight? Well, more than conquerors isn't barely squeaking out a win. More than conquerors is you win by a decided knockout and you're still standing there going, anybody else? Come on up. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38, I am persuaded, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. So you pretty much covered it all, right? Nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So today, prayer is not a guarantee. Probably anything prayer Prayer aligns us with God probably more than anything else. And even though our circumstances may not change, we have the comfort of God because we've got you know, 
said I can go to the chiropractor, you know, and you got a kink in your back, and he, I'm like, oh, that works better. Prayer is kind of like our spiritual chiropractor. So even though our circumstances may not change, we can take comfort knowing that God's in control. Um, I mentioned before about Hannah, you know, she, she's wanting a, a child. She goes to the temple, and she's praying earnestly, but she's not praying out loud. Of course, the priest, stupid Eli, goes, woman, why are you praying? Why are you drunk? I'm not drunk, you know, and all that. So um, she left, and her countenance was changed. Nothing had changed in her circumstance, but she was in the line with God. Uh, I'm going to skip the next point just for time. We're going to jump down to uh, lesser known suspects of conflicting views. I'll just say in tongues, basically, they, they did cease, and even when they were in operation, they were for evangelism purposes. Uh, look at your verses there, 1 Corinthians 14, 22, where he talks about that tongues were a sign for uh, unbelievers. Um, and just and some of the things people say about them, if they were a sign of spirituality, first of all, when we read about the first advent of tongues in Acts chapter 2, everyone had this book, not just the spiritual people. And the Corinthians, who were known as one of the most carnal churches, they spoke in tongues. And um, so it's not an idea of a second blessing, anything like that. But And if you, you get through all that and you still want to believe that that's in operation for today, okay, I'll just say them didn't use the rules that Paul laid out for their operation in the church. And it says only one at a time, only with an interpreter, and uh, I'm outnumbered here, but no women, Paul says. Anyway, but conflicting views... Lesser known suspect. We often know how to distinguish about healings, miracles, tongues. But there's some more subtle things that creep in. I'm going back to our premise of expectations of what do we expect in our Christian life. Are our expect expectations based on this or are they based on psychology today or something you watched on TV? Our corrupt culture. And there's a lot of things that's, that get into our mind that we aren't maybe aware of it kind of sneaks in because that's the way Satan is um, we tend to think that we deserve more than we have only good things should happen to us because after all we're Christians and even culture just notice how uh, get, your, get your homeowner's policy out uh, and notice how they always define an act of God it's never a good thing in an insurance policy. We don't we don't insure against acts of God. You know, so when, when something bad happens, we're quick to blame God or the world is. Um, of course, when something good happens, well, we're we're happy to take the credit for that, but not when something bad happens. We think that well, every everybody should like us. Life should be a bed of roses, but is that realistic? And more importantly, is it biblical? So there, there's a book I read a few years ago called, I can't remember the title, but it talked about um, misbeliefs that we have. And he defined a misbelief as something that we believe, but it's not true. So it's a misbelief. Um, a misbelief might be, well, you know, in order for me to be happy, I need to have, you know, fill in the blank. I need to have my children be well behaved and love me. I need to have a perfect marriage. I got to have a great boss. All those things are great if you have them, but are they necessary for your happiness? Well, if they are, then you, you've got misplaced happiness. We, it, a misbelief is something we've told ourselves so often that we, we think it's true. Here's one truth that you need to latch on to. God loves you. God accepts you for who you are. Period. End of story. You are accepted in the beloved. And the word of God says, that's all you need. So I, I could go on a limb, and I will. I think I could safely say that all of our anger, resentment, 
in depression is because we have wrong expectations. We ex have ex expectations that are wrong in the first place or we're focusing on the wrong things. How often do we get angry because someone didn't do what we wanted them to do? Or if something didn't turn out the way we wanted it to turn out? But is our expectation realistic or is it biblical? And even if you have a realistic expectation, even if it is biblical, did you ever tell this person what you expected? Or maybe we just managed to expect them to read our mind and know what we wanted them to do? And maybe I'm only talking about my marriage. <laughs> but how often do you get angry at your spouse because they didn't do what you wanted them to do? <clears throat> well, if you love me, you'd know. No, that's not true. I can't read your mind. Or vice versa. Let's look at what some true expectations should be. Now, I know this first reference in John 16 is a kingdom verse, but we can pull out a... Um, a transdispensational trans application. And you'll probably know this verse once you get to it. You know, oh yeah, I'm, I remember that verse. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Notice he says, in me you're going to have peace. You're not going to have it in the world, but... In the world, what? You will. Indicative again. Not subjective. Maybe in the world you will have tribulation. Of course, he's talking, he's talking here about, you know, yeah, they're going to go through the great tribulation as the Jews. But even in even as a Jew having to face the tribulation, what is he saying? Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. We can go now, we can go to the we got the whole book. We can go to the book of Revelation. We know how it ends. So we can still say, even in us, we see the same principle in Paul's teachings. What to expect in the world. Um, those little country song back and saying, I, I never promised you a rose garden. So in the world... Expect tribulation. Don't don't let tribulation sucker punch you to where you're doubled over and you can't breathe. Romans eight, uh, going back to Romans eight, uh, verse uh, seventeen talks about. Well, verse sixteen says, "The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him." that we also be glorified with him. So it's, it's part of it. And um, of course, get to verse 18, and he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. In verse 19, it goes on to talk about how the creation was subject to futility, and you know, which brings you back to Genesis chapter 3, where we have the fall and everything was put into subjection to that, to sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And 3. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Again, don't, don't miss that little word in Paul's because when he says that, that's always your purpose clause. So God doesn't comfort us just to keep it all of ourselves. He says, God comforts us so we can in turn comfort others with that same comfort that he's given us. And uh, pay it forward, you know, spread it around. So he goes on to say, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, 
So he's saying I, the sufferings of Christ are abounding. That's, that's, he has a lot of suffering, but his consolation also abounds through Christ. So, verse 7, we, our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolations. And he goes on and talks about some of the things that he had gone through. And um, he had some pretty rough times there. Philippians 1.29 For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Don't you wish that second half of the verse wasn't in there? I remember going to the past years ago, I was stationed up in Alaska, and it would have been in the late 70s, and I was kind of having my, uh, you know, Pity party, and I went to him to talk about some stuff. He, he brought these verses out and said, "Well, you know, Dave, you're you're, uh, you're called to suffer. <laughs> That's not what I came to you for. To hear that, you know, I didn't want to hear that." Second Timothy chapter three, verse twelve. He says, "Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution." I used to wonder what that meant. Now it's just something as simple as saying men can't have babies. You're going to suffer persecution. That's hate speech. So be properly prepared mentally as to what we expect from this world. Um, for some reason this popped into my head um, in one of the Sherlock Holmes movies. Uh, I think it was the Robert... Robert Downey Jr. in the new one. The villain whispers in, whispers to him from his jail cell and says, Steal your mind, Holmes. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to steal our mind to be prepared for this world that we live in. How do we do that? Well, Romans chapter 12 is one of those things that's, um, as the saying goes, it's very simple, but it's not easy. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, that's a command, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So it's, uh, it's simple, but it's not easy. If we do that, we can prove to ourselves what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now go back to where we were before in Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Philippians 4 and verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. That's hard. Now, anxious doesn't mean you don't care about things. Anxious, the, the word there has the idea of a, a distracting care, something that you just you can't get out of your head. It's just a constant distraction. So notice the contrast here. He says, Paul says, don't be anxious for anything, but in contrast that, in everything, nothing in everything, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, does God know your request before you even speak? Of course he does. What's the purpose? It's for your benefit, not for God's. Let your requests be made known to God. What's the result? It doesn't say you're going to get your request, whether you're praying for healing, for instance. But it says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it's beyond comprehension. Sometimes lost people look at Christians going through the fires, and that's why it's important to be honest in our Christian life. Don't say, oh, everything's just wonderful. What kind of a testimony is that? But when they see you going through hell on earth, 
and you can do it with rejoicing because you know what it's all about, the world's going, how can you, how can you be so calm? How can, how can you have peace in this kind of situation? And you can explain. But it says here, well, the peace of God it surpasses all human understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What is it? Guard your hearts. Keep it in context. You got to ask, well, for what? Guard it against what? It goes back to the beginning of the verse 6. If we can do this, again, it's simple, not easy. If we're not anxious for anything, but if we're taking everything to God in prayer, remember the song, take it to the Lord in prayer. It will guard your hearts against being anxious. It will guard your hearts against worry. So I was saying about worry, it, um, it never prevents anything. And I can't think of that too. But if we can do this, it will guard our hearts and minds through Christ. So then he tells us in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That's why I quit listening to talk radio right here. I just got worked up. I just got worked up. I got angry. I got fired up. I had nowhere to go with it. I thought about buying one of those big punching bags to hang in my living room so I could listen to the talk radio and everybody just and scream and punch it, you know. But it wouldn't really accomplish anything. What are we expecting? Well, if we could do this, I guarantee you, if we could, if we could do this, we would take care of the majority of our problems. But as they say, easier said than done. Troubles versus happiness. So again, coming back to this whole thing of expectations, maybe. What is your basic uh, default setting? You know, how, how do you look at life? Well, Job 5, 7 says what? Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Now, if you've ever been out camping or had a fire pit in your backyard and someone tosses a log in there, have you ever seen the sparks go down? No. And Job's saying, just as sure as every time, 100%, sparks always go up, man is born to trouble. Psalm uh, 90 and 10 talks about this. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of drink they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. That's what scripture says life is about. It's ever since the fall, it's going to be, that should be our expectation. Galatians 1 4. So when 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 bad things happen, I'm trying to learn to expect it. When the car breaks down, when I get sick, whatever it is, yeah, that that's life. One of the best that, that verse didn't sound right is the wrong book. Verse uh, 4 of Galatians 1, it says, talking about Christ, he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. So again, Paul uses those words frequently describing the world that we're in, the world system that we're in. It's a present evil age it's ruled by Satan in the heavenlies Ephesians 5 16 redeem the time make the most of it 
because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And 2 Timothy 3, 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Uh, talk about today's headlines. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. Sounds like the headlines, doesn't it? So what do we expect? We expect, I just think people are all kind of good inside. You know, if we just gave them the right environment, the work would be wonderful. We just, the answer is education and a proper environment and the world would be wonderful. Garden of Eden, wasn't that wonderful environment? Wasn't that perfect? man still fell. Even in the millennium, we're going to have a pretty much perfect environment. And at the end of that, what happens? Satan is released and he draws out people who have just been uh, complying outwardly and are still rebelling against God. There's going to be another uprising. So it's not an environment, it's the human heart. As we read in the scriptures, deceitfully wicked. You know, who can know it? So what do we expect? Do we expect troubles or do we expect happiness? Again, the secret to a baby, your happiness is to lower your expectations. Reason for living, do we live for him or do we live for ourselves? If we're expecting this life to uh, please us, yeah, we're gonna be disappointed. Romans 14, eight says, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. In 2 Corinthians 5.15 And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them, and rose again. So that's our focus. That was Paul's focus talk to the Philippians about um, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So we focus on God's glory, not on what makes us happy. First uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 20 says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, as far as I'm concerned, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Gain, gain more Christ. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. I do not know if Paul was given a choice there. But I don't know why I would choose if I was given a choice. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. Let's go to verse. Uh, I gotta go to verse 1. If then or since then we are raised with Christ, we are to seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, again, there's that steal your mind concept, right? Set your mind on things above. Focus on things above, not on things on the earth. For, because you died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So, I have to check myself and make sure I'm not letting the world and its philosophies infiltrate my brain. And so when I look at things that are going on, to be discouraged and downhearted, um, 
you read in the Psalms where even David was like, man, why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper and what in the world's going on? And it's like, well, God's in control. God's still on his throne. It may not always feel like it, but we know by faith that God's in control and nothing's taken him by surprise. It's all working out the way he planned it to work. And as it said in Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So even though all the stuff that's going on around us, we focus not on all the stuff, but we focus on the Lord. So what do we expect? Well, if we understand the dispensation of the grace of God, we understand we have a realistic expectation redundant. We have a realistic expectation of what to expect. There's probably a better way to put that. But you get the point. We, we can take the understanding of this current dispensation and look, look at the world around us and go, yeah, that makes sense. We're not expecting peace and prosperity and people to be good. When someone does you wrong, Yes, you can expect it, right? So we pray in accordance with God's will. God may choose to heal us when it comes to physical infirmities. So I, I said, well, you are, are you an optimistic? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? I, neither. I prefer to be a realist based on the scripture. Based on their proper understanding for God's plan and for the ages and where we fit. And the Bible never says to rejoice in the bad things. It says we can rejoice in the Lord in those things. This it says in James. Count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. So we, and we're not rejoicing in the temptation or the trial. We rejoice in knowing what God is doing through that trial to bring us more into conformity to the image of Christ. So it's all on what we focus on. And um, it's so easy to get sucked into it, though, to the world system. So if we keep our focus on the Lord, again, it's not easy, but it is simple. If we have realistic expectations of ourselves, of others, of the world, and we focus on the proper things, we can avoid the anger and the depression and the hopelessness that the world has because again we, we know who's in control and we know how it all ends let's pray god thank you for your word and the confidence it can give us to have truly truly have peace in our heart and not to be distressed about this world system because we know that you are in control we know that we are accepted in Christ and we are accepted in the beloved and you love us with an everlasting love and you love us just because. You don't love us based on our behavior. You don't love us less when we mess up and you don't love us more if we think we're doing the right thing. We are your adopted sons in Christ. And because of that, your love is everlasting and nothing can separate us from it. Lord, help us to keep that in our minds as we walk throughout this world in the following week. In your name we pray. Amen.